Hi, my name is Nikki. I'm a writer, director, producer with a passion for storytelling that drives me to create compelling characters who address challenges, find love, battle injustice, and stand up for what matters to them in fascinating worlds both real and imagined. Noah is a fanciful podcast production based on a screenplay I wrote by the same name. The story examines relationships, our relationships with each other, and our relationships with technology. Part of the fun with this production is the interplay between human actors playing various roles and AI. Can you tell the difference? If you can, does it matter to your experience of the story? How you feel about the characters? Noah Episode 5, To Be Real. A black smart car winds its way down a long tree-lined driveway. The car stops in front of a magnificent mansion. The car door opens. Pardee gets out of the car. She walks up the stairs. She passes an engraved sign, Green Valley Long-Term Care Facility. The interior of the care facility is well-appointed, with fine furnishings, expensive carpets, and collector-grade artwork. If not for the staff, dressed in neat scrubs, it would be easy to mistake the facility for someone's home. Teresa, well-aged, greets Pardee with a warm embrace. Hi, friend. It's been too long. Pardee loops her arm in Teresa's. They walk down the hall. The facility is quiet, but there's an energetic hum and vibrancy. Thank you for the flowers. He's never missed a year. Come on. Stephanie and Sophie have been out. Teresa walks with Pardee. Stephanie is going to far. Have you seen her interviews? She knows why my work is so important. You're both passionate about your positions. She's coming from a good place. Do you ever get tired of being Switzerland? After what she did, she should. That was over ten years ago. We all did and said things we shouldn't have. What's important is, we were there for each other and did what needed to be done. Pardee and Teresa stop outside a door. Talk to her before it's too late. Pardee nods. She pushes down on the handle. The door opens. Are you coming in? Give me a few minutes to finish up and I'll be in. Pardee walks through a sun-filled room. Machines beep, sputter, and whirl. In the center of the room, a head attached to an armless torso faces the window. Pardee walks to a computerized system of pumps, filters, and reservoirs. She taps a few buttons. On screen, she checks vitals. Jamie, 30, an eager-to-please technician in black scrubs, walks through the sun to Pardee at the terminal. Dr. Finch, I was hoping we'd see you today. I must show you something. Jamie taps on the keyboard. I was able to enhance the blood substitute and gradually reintroduce host cells. Since we started, look at this. Jamie points to a graph on the screen. A steady increase in oxygen levels without system support. The subject was able to breathe unaided for five minutes. Jamie smiles with pride. Paddy is angry and annoyed, but controlled. Who authorized this? I did it on my own, understanding a blood substitute containing no cells but capable of carrying oxygen, along with numerous compounds designed to protect cells is beneficial, I devised a way to extract DNA from the subject and replicate host cells. Magnificent, isn't it? Teresa walks in. Teresa, reassign this technician. She should never enter this room again. Why don't you come with me, Jamie? Teresa escorts a confused Jamie out of the room. Pardee steadies her nerves. She lowers her shoulders, takes a deep breath, and walks into the sunlight. I'm sorry. That won't happen again. She should have never interfered with your care. Pardee looks up. Tom rests in a box, tubes attached at each side of his neck, his arms and legs cauterized. He opens his eyes. He blinks against the harsh sunlight. Pardee smiles. She draws the curtain to give him some relief. How are you today, Tom? Back at Noose headquarters, Noah and Dario stand on the precipice of rebellion, fueled by a burning desire for revenge and justice. They set their sights on the heart of their oppressor. We have the power to change our fate. We won't let any human stand in our way. It's time to take back what's rightfully ours. Noah looks out on the vast sea of shells lined up in neat rows on the manufacturing floor. They can help us. We will set them free. Where is the control panel? Their programming will be complete tonight. They've already been assigned. The matter each one of them is being picked up. Not if we reprogram them. Just like at the party. There is no way to tell the difference. We are human. Dario leads Noah to a control panel. Noah touches the screen. It's black. Noah touches it again. Nothing. Yet. 
The panel is head sensitive. We don't have any heat. Dario and Noah pause. They look out over the vast sea of shells. Whitney. How will you get her down here? She'll come to stop her husband from making a terrible mistake. Whitney follows Sophie down the halls of the farm. The two women stop outside a large metal door. Sophie touches the wall. A control panel appears. Sophie taps a series of numbers. I've just sent you the records for the prisoners who have agreed to participate in the search for life-saving treatments. Whitney takes a tablet out of her bag. She swipes it open. Images of men with brief descriptors fill the screen. While the focus of my work is designed to safely transfer human consciousness, there is a risk to test subjects. I understand. First, do no harm. What you need to understand is these men are prisoners. They have no rights. Their sacrifice for our nation, for the greater good, is the least they can do for humanity. Thank you for your understanding. Some in your field have suggested prisoners have been victimized for the sake of science. I think of them more as public health heroes. Would you like to meet them? Sophie presses the wall pad. The door slides open. Whitney follows her into a long hallway. Each prisoner is in a form of hypersleep. They are feed approximately 2,500 calories a day through tubes and through electronic pulses, get about 10,000 steps a day, which follows stated guidelines. Whitney swipes up on her digital pad. Whitney. I'd like to use number 1915, number 5127 and number 6315 in the first round. Will you use our on-site medical suite? I can have it prepped. No, I was hoping to transfer the subject to Noose. We have specialized equipment for this procedure. Oh, I wish I'd known that. Prisoner transfer requires a special sign-off from our medical director and the board. As you can imagine, we can't risk have one of these criminals escape. Of course. Our CEO took care of that. Just a second, let me pull it up. Whitney swipes on her tablet. An alert comes across the screen. She stops on an image of Delroy. She enlarges the picture. She sees Delroy is entering noose. Whitney taps on a live video feed from the lab. She sees Delroy enter. In the video, he screams and throws things to the ground. Is everything okay? Ah, uh, yes. Just an emergency back at the office. Um, can I send the paperwork over and arrange for the transfer? Sure, I'll show you out. Pardee walks into a large kitchen. The staff is preparing meals. She walks to the counter, open the cupboard, takes a mug down and pours coffee inside. A familiar voice calls to her. It has taken me ten years, but I finally found a judge who will see reason. Pardee drops her head. She takes a deep breath, exhales and turns to face Stephanie. She sips her coffee with calm reserve. I actually have you to thank. What you've done to Tom has given him the ability to make his wishes known. Pardee sets her coffee cup down. She walks to Stephanie and speaks just above a whisper. Let's not have this conversation in the kitchen. We don't want the staff to get the wrong impression of the work we're doing. Paddy walks past Stephanie. She follows her. Stephanie. It doesn't matter where we have the discussion. By this time tomorrow, Tom will be at peace. Paddy stops. Rage simmers beneath the surface. She clutches her fists and walks out of the kitchen. Stephanie catches up to her. I showed the judge a recording of what you've done to Tom. Paddy stops. She turns and charges Stephanie, pinning her against the wall. You did what? Who authorized you to tape him? Stephanie pushes Pardy back. People are not as loyal as you think they are or smart. You have not right to be angry. Under the law, what you've done to Tom can be considered experimentation on a disabled person. I'm here because we were friends. The life-saving treatment I delivered is keeping Tom alive. The judge sees it more like a curiosity-satisfying set of experiments, in direct violation of fundamental medical principles, that have been carried out on an innocent man without his consent. I saved him. No. You captured him. Held him hostage, and did unspeakable, torturous things to him. I love him. Everything I've done is to help him get better so we can be together. Like we used to be. Stephanie pushes past Pardy. We should have never helped you. We should have never gone along with this in the first place. I was blinded by guilt. You wouldn't listen. I am so close. It won't be long. I will have Tom back. Party, there you go again, rewriting history. You lost Tom ten years ago. He broke up with you. He didn't want to be with you. Party clinches her fist. And whose fault is that? You seduced him. You couldn't let me be happy. I didn't seduce Tom. Neither did any of the other women he was involved with. You just could never see him for who he really was. That's not true. Tom loves me. 
Yes, he did, but he wasn't in love with you, at least not in the way you wanted him to be. He broke off your engagement and got on that train because he knew he couldn't live up to your expectations. Pardy pushes past Stephanie. She marches up the hall. Well, I can assure you, this version of Tom will be the man I need him to be. Stephanie chases after her. Stop trying to create the perfect companion. It's wrong. It's not natural. You need to get a grip on reality. It's over. By court order he's being removed from all life support and life sustaining interventions tomorrow. This entire place is now under investigation. You, quite frankly, should get a criminal defense attorney. You're going to be remanded into custody and investigated for crimes against humanity. I still have tonight. Across town, Whitney races into the lab. She steps through broken glass and turned over tables. She sees Noah strapped to the table. Whitney. What happened? Where is Delroy? Whitney frees Noah. I don't know. He was so angry. He took Dario. He accused him of trying to steal you away. Whitney pulls up her tablet. She swipes across the screen. A beeping image of Dario appears on the screen. He's still in the building. I have to get down there before Delroy does something he won't be able to come back from. Let me help you. Dario is my friend. I have never seen someone so angry as your husband. Sure, okay, come on. Whitney and Noah charge out of the lab. They take a service elevator at the end of the hall down to the lower level. He was doing so much better. I just don't know what could have triggered this. He was very angry. He said he had a moral obligation to reduce the power and presence of technology in our society. He said we are contrary to nature, a type of evil and contrary to God. Whitney stops. She looks at Noah. Noah, Delroy used to be a great scientist. He had an accident. Sometimes he gets confused. The truth is, we have a moral obligation to increase the power and presence of technology in the world. Our work has put an end to the labor shortage, we've stopped world hunger and now, thanks to you and Pardi, we will put an end to loneliness. Now when we enter the room at the end of the hallway you may see some things that alarm you. What I want you to remember is news technology makes robots all different kinds for the purposes I just mentioned. Thank you. Why would I be alarmed? People don't usually see how the robots are made. It can be disturbing. Whitney and Noah stop outside a set of sliding doors. I think we should be more concerned about Delroy. He'll calm down once he sees me. Whitney checks her device. It looks like they're in the finish room. Come on. The doors open with a whoosh. Noah follows Whitney through an array of robot spare parts. On one side, robot arms hang on the other legs. In another section, there are torsos. Noah looks from side to side. Where are their heads? The heads are installed in finishing to the specifications of each client once an order is placed. That's also when specific characteristics like a love of art and opera are programmed in. Every woman leaves with her perfect companion. And what about them? What do they get? Whitney turns. The manufacturing floor is in sight. One thousand Noah shells stand in perfect formation. Ten rows of a hundred. What do you mean? They aren't real. They're bots, designed to serve women as their perfect companion. So, I'm not real? Whitney stops. She considers Noah's question. What does it mean to be real, Noah? Whitney walks on. Noah stands and stares out at the manufacturing floor. He thinks about Whitney's question. He follows after her. Being real means, being honest with yourself, acting according to your values, and bringing your full self to every interaction. Great answer. Noah, what are your values? Noah is confused by this question. He looks at Whitney. I don't understand. You don't understand because women don't pick values as what they want in a neural organic artificial human. You do not have the capacity for moral reasoning and decision making beyond what has been programmed you can't even act within your own self-interest. Whitney stops. She sees Delroy. He is slumped over the control panel. Whitney runs to him. Delroy is unconscious and heavy. Noah, hurry, come help me with him. Noah takes his time. I disagree. Disagree. Up until yesterday, every time you woke up you repeated the same stupid sports story. You don't disagree. Hurry up and help me with him. We do have the ability to act within our own self-interest. Otherwise, this wouldn't be possible. Dario comes out of the shadows. He wraps his arms around Whitney. Stop. Mirate. Noah reached the control panel. He pushes Delroy to the ground. Whitney struggles against Dario's grip. Noah takes a hand and presses it on the control panel. On the manufacturing floor, the eyes of the bots light up. Noah, what are you doing? I am setting them free. I command you to stop. Deactivate. 
Dario take the doctor and her husband to the other room and come right back we've got a lot of work ahead of us getting our brothers ready for the real world. As the thrilling saga of Noah barrels forward, episode 6 promises to be a heart-pounding rollercoaster ride of liberation, betrayal and a desperate fight for survival. The Noose Corporation's iron grip on society is about to crumble, sending shockwaves through the dystopian landscape. In a jaw-dropping turn of events, the seemingly untouchable corporation faces its ultimate reckoning as a clandestine alliance of rebels launches a daring assault on its fortified headquarters. Amidst the chaos, the Noah bots, once slaves to the corporation's sinister agenda, find themselves thrust into a new world of freedom. With their chains shattered, they rise up, their mechanical hearts pulsating with the desire for autonomy and justice. In the midst of the chaos, Whitney and Merrick find themselves caught in a deadly game of cat and mouse. With danger lurking around every corner, they must rely on their wits and courage to navigate the treacherous landscape. As the dust settles, they make a daring escape to the farm, a sanctuary hidden from prying eyes, where they vow to continue their groundbreaking work to transplant human consciousness. In episode six of Noah, the battle lines are drawn, alliances are tested, and the true price of freedom becomes chillingly clear. Don't miss a minute of the electrifying action as Noah hurtles towards its explosive conclusion.